And uh, specifically though, um, how it will interface with the work that you do at the county level as a sanitarian. Uh, uh, so I'm gonna go into uh, uh, standard acknowledgement. Uh, the views of this uh, presentation are my own and not those of the federal government. And what are those views you might ask? So over the next hour, um, in excruciating detail, uh, we're gonna go over the laboratory flexible funding model. And while uh, nothing's more fun than hear somebody else talk about a grant that you're not involved in, uh, one thing I think you're gonna find kind of humorous about this grant is the name. Um, the actual name of this grant is the laboratory flexible funding model clinical trials not allowed. And I have to think that that last part probably accidentally made it on the, uh, the track but, uh, but what we do here and what all of us who are in the LFFM grant uh, do is we just drop that clinical trials not allowed and we call it the LFFM grant. And that's how I'm gonna refer to it throughout the uh, presentation. And uh, what, the, um, what the LFFM grant does is it, um, it really uh, uh, focuses on three aspects, uh, food defense for chemistry, microbiology and radiochemistry uh, there, we have two special projects that were funded, one in chemistry and one in microbiology. And, uh, and then the food safety aspect, uh, which is how we'll be working with uh, you, uh, the sanitarians, um, over the next uh, five years and hopefully beyond that. And the mechanism for us working together is going to be FISMA, uh, all of our favorite acronym, the Food Safety Modernization Act, and in particular, uh, how the laboratory work that we will provide ties into the Manufactured Food Regulatory Program Standards, or MFRPS. Uh, so first off, uh, what we're gonna do is uh, take a deep breath and take a look outside, and this is our laboratory. Some of you have been here. Uh, some of you, I know we've presented, uh, we've uh, hosted this uh, San Council meeting in the igloo, which is the silver uh, uh, part of the building off to the right-hand side of the photograph. Uh, and uh, hopefully if you were here, uh, you got to, uh, to do a lab tour. Um, if not, uh, please know that once this pandemic is over, our lab is open for tours again, and we do love giving tours. Uh, in a nutshell, the second floor is microbiology, the third floor is chemistry and newborn screening, and, um, and I think we're all ready for an uh, in-person meeting in uh, some point maybe in 2021. But right now we're going to jump into uh, what the laboratory flexible funding model is, the LFFM, and in February of this year, the FDA released a funding opportunity uh, that uh, introduced a new approach to food safety, uh, in particular laboratory food safety. And by a new approach, what I mean is that the old approach I I here in laboratory work is, uh, is more reactive. You know, we in the lab, we react to an outbreak. We react to a poisoning, we react to a complaint. Uh, and we're very good at reacting in public health. So what the FDA has done is they've incorporated that reaction and added a proactive aspect to it using intelligence uh, and sampling. And by intelligence, I'm meaning the, the type of intelligence one gets when one has security clearances and one is sitting around talking about the threats against the country's food supply. Uh, so that type of intelligence is incorporated into a surveillance-based lab activity, which is the prevention-based, that's on the slide that's, um, that's highlighted. And then through surveillance, we can uh, determine if um, there are problems within uh, the food quality that is sold here or manufactured here uh, in the United States. And in particular, we're focusing on three different types of sample analysis. First, the food itself, the food product, and that can be purchased retail or that can be uh, uh, collected by a sanitarian at a manufacturing facility. Uh, the whole genome sequencing of positive isolates, um, you know, obviously you're gonna need an outbreak for these samples to come about and no one wants an outbreak, but we all know they happen. Uh, and we're going to get into whole genome sequencing uh, here in a moment because uh, that's one of the funding um, areas. 
And then there's emerging, emergency response and emerging issues. Um, emergency response is really uh, what I would call food defense. And I'm gonna go into some detail as to what that is, but it's essentially it's preparedness work. Uh, preparedness is the public health um, uh, word for terrorism preparedness, uh, of course. And um, emergency response is uh, much along the work of, um, along those lines. You're looking for threats of gross contamination in, in the food supply. Uh, emerging issues are unforeseen events that affect the food supply. Uh, one example of an emerging issue uh, would be the uh, 2011 Fukushima nuclear power plant collapse uh, during the earthquake and resulting tsunami that uh, released uh, radioactive iodine and cesium into the atmosphere uh, that then went into the jet stream, uh, filtered down into across North America and was detectable in dairy products um, throughout Canada and the United States. Um, so that would be an example of an emerging issue. Uh, this grant, the LFFM grant, is specific to human and animal food testing labs. We are a human food testing laboratory here at ADHS. Uh, and in all, um, the FDA awarded uh, roughly $23 million to 100 labs. Uh, and then on our end, we were successful on seven um, tracks, is what they call a grant, seven tracks for um, uh, 995000 a year. So we're pretty happy about that. Uh, and uh, those seven tracks are, um, are grants, are uh, four for chemistry. Uh, there's a food defense uh, component, a food safety component, method development and method validation. There are two for microbiology, food defense and whole genome sequencing. And then one for radiochemistry and then that is for food defense. And if you're looking at this, you see the repetitive food defense, food defense, food defense. And so uh, I'm gonna jump into what all these grants mean and I'm gonna start with food defense. And if you start with food defense, you gotta go back in time because we're gonna go back to the days of 9-11. And when Secretary of Health and Human Services, Tommy Thompson, uh, uh, under the uh, second Bush administration, um, was uh, overseeing, um, uh, of course, Health and Human Services, and he uh, made a very uh, uh, famous uh, statement. Um, and he said, uh, for the life of me, I cannot understand why the terrorists have not attacked our food supply, because it is so easy to do. And he got a lot of flack for that, uh, because, oh, you're giving terrorists ideas. Well, the terrorists already had ideas. And what uh, uh, Director Thompson understood was that the money that was being uh, floated about for preparedness purposes, none of it was earmarked towards food defense. And at that time, and we're talking back in 2004, so that's only three years after 9-11, at that time, the capacity within the United States to respond to a, uh, a food terrorism incident uh, was virtually... I can't say non-existent, but it was almost completely isolated at the federal level. Um, and even therein, it would, was somewhat siloed. Uh, so uh, while there were, are, were states that had capacity to assist, the methodology wasn't uniform, the instrumentation wasn't uniform, the training wasn't uniform. Uh, and so uh, it would have been uh, very difficult to respond in a coordinated manner uh, to a, um, a food terrorist event. And, um, and uh, uh, Director Thomas didn't saw that. Uh, he garnered uh, um, uh, quite a bit of support uh, through his, um, his bringing up um, this rather obvious fact. And um, while you can't uh, necessarily give uh, one person credit for the formation of a federal um, bureaucracy, uh, you know, he certainly deserves a share of it because through that effort, uh, FERN was um, created. Um, FERN is the Food Emergency Response Network, and it is a network of uh, food testing laboratories uh, at um, your local, state, and federal levels that look for um, uh, contamination, adulteration um, of uh, foods that is sold here in the United States. Um, 
be it uh, retail or commercial. Um, and uh, it looks for, uh, there's a biological, chemical, and radiological uh, component. Um, so we here at the AHS laboratory have been a FERN um, member since 2005. Oh, and, um, and so we, are, we have a great deal of experience with uh, food defense. And I'll get into that uh, just in a moment here. But, um, but the neat thing about, uh, uh, just to kind of keep on with the history, the neat thing about uh, what Fern did is it broke down silos. So this is a rather busy slide and I uh, apologize for that. But, um, but what this slide uh, shows is that, uh, that you had a, a structure, a federal structure between two different agencies. So y'all are familiar with the Food Safety and Inspection Services, FSIS, and you know that they're part of the USDA, and you know that the USDA is part of the Department of Agriculture, and everyone knows that the FDA is part of Health and Human Services, but those are two different federal agencies, um, and they had two different laboratory structures. Uh, however, their analytical methods were virtually the same. Uh, when you're analyzing for uh, chemicals in food, pathogens in food, uh, radio radiologicals in food, um, you're really looking for the contaminant and the matrix uh, becomes a challenge in the manner of which you extract the contaminant. So what Fern did is it opened up a bridge in between the FDA labs and the USDA laboratories and then opened up a more uh, of a, a communication and funding opportunities for states such as ours and we are located if, if on the bottom track of that uh, four boxes over it says FDA cooperative agreement right next to that says FSIS cooperative agreement. Um, the LFFM grant is part of the uh, FDA cooperative agreement. So um, this is how uh, in a nutshell uh, this is how, how the food safety or uh, pardon me food defense um, structure is uh, at the federal level and how it ties in with us here at the state level and so um, what is food defense and what are we actually doing? What are we getting, what is the FDA asking us to do for the next five years? Well, they're really asking us to continue on the work we've been doing for, for the previous 15. Uh, and that is to identify poisons and toxins in food. Um, when you're looking at food defense work, you're really looking at uh, gross contamination. You're looking at um, uh, uh, compounds uh, that are deadly, um, that have a, um, uh, that, and you're, you're identifying those, um, whether they're large molecules or metallic molecules or whatnot, uh, depending on the instrumentation. So what we do is uh, we, as a, um, uh, as a network, we utilize uh, mass spectrometry, uh, in particular um, GCMS, uh, gas chromatograph mass spectrometers, as well as um, LC tandem mass specs, uh, liquid chromatograph, um, and then two mass spectrometers. Um, and those are utilized uh, for organic compound analyses. Uh, and then on the metal side, we use uh, ICPMS, which is a ductly coupled plasma mass spectrometry uh, as a confirmation, and XRF as a surveillance tool uh, so that we can triage samples more effectively. Um, all the work we do here at ADHS is under ISO 17025 uh, accreditation. Um, and we have one of the best uh, quality assurance, quality control um, programs in any state lab in the nation. Uh, now, one, one of the aspects on preparedness is that uh, you don't necessarily have a sample load. So it's much the same as a firehouse. And um, when there's not a fire, uh, the firemen and the firewomen um, have to keep themselves busy. They train, they maintain their equipment, uh, and they, they're ready to go because when that bell rings, they've got to go out and put out a fire. That really defines preparedness across the board. And so um, as a, uh, a food defense laboratory, we're very involved in uh, exercises uh, where samples will come in out of the blue, you have to run, or special events such as Super Bowl or uh, the um, uh, inauguration um, or whatnot, uh, where uh, food is being um, uh, surveilled that will be sold at those events. Um, we here at ADHS, are known for our method development and, um, and in particular right now we are, are quite a bit on a, uh, a, a, a 
really fascinating um, analytical technique called high resolution accurate mass spec. Uh, and uh, with this is really revolutionizing um, LCMS and will become the uh, industry standard here uh, within the next five years. Uh, so we've got to jump on that. Um, we're really, really, really stoked. And this is the second grant, uh, food defense grant. And we're really, really, we can't be happier uh, that we have a radiochemistry laboratory. Um, now, you, oh, some of you may be wondering when on earth did ADHS get a radiochemistry laboratory? Well, it was in 2018. Um, you may recall um, the Arizona Radiation Regulatory Agency uh, and um, uh, that uh, group was merged into ADHS uh, and then became the Bureau of Radiation Control. Uh, the Bureau of Radiation Control has a radiation measurements laboratory um, and they do great work with environmental samples. They do a lot of work at, at, the, um, at the power. We, we approached the uh, uh, Bureau of Radiation Control and asked them if they'd want to become a food radiation laboratory and they jumped at, at the opportunity. And, um, and we are really excited because uh, across the United States, uh, public health laboratories are losing the ability to look at, uh, for um, radiation. Um, Rad labs are very expensive to maintain, and, uh, and they are also uh, difficult to staff because of the expertise needed. Um, and so uh, to add uh, rad capacity uh, to our food analysis um, is just really spectacular. Um, so they're starting from scratch, but, um, but they're a great group, and they're going to do a great job. And uh, they're going to be uh, focused on detecting uh, gamma, alpha, and beta radiation in food. Um, and we'll get them under ISO accreditation. And, uh, and so that's the second grant. The third is microbiology. Um, on this one, now uh, we are a, a long time uh, firm microbiology lab, again, about 15 years. Our micro uh, section um, uh, has uh, been an FSIS laboratory. So looking at meat matrices um, uh, for, uh, the for, for the past 15 years and um, is known for their uh, method development as well. And, um, and on this end, of course, you know, microbiology, you're looking for pathogens in food, uh, you're utilizing fern uh, methodology. They also are ISO accredited. Uh, they also are involved in exercises and special events. Um, so it, it's much the same as chemistry. Um, and of course, but it's just a, a different discipline. Um, so uh, those are the three um, food defense tracks uh, that we will be working on uh, moving forward or continuing to work on moving forward. Uh, and now I'm going to get into the new parts of the grant. Um, in particular, a, uh, a project with whole genome sequencing. Um, and we're pretty um, excited about this because uh, we have been working with the Translational Genomics Research Institute of TGen um, with a genome tracker since uh, 2014. Um, so we've been a longtime partner. Uh, and, uh, and we are able to continue that partnership uh, with the LFFM grant. Uh, and so on, on that end, if you're not familiar with uh, what um, Genome Tracker is, uh, it, it basically uses whole genome sequencing of uh, uh, pathogens. Um, it collects and shares the genomic data uh, of, of uh, foodborne pathogen incidents, and then that allows for uh, comparisons and analysis in real time that can help speed up uh, food illness investigations on the epidemiology side. Uh, there are 48 uh, genome tracker labs in the United States and 21 internationally. Um, so within your jurisdiction, if you have an outbreak uh, and, um, and we are able to obtain uh, food that's related with that outbreak and the pathogen that's responsible uh, can be isolated, then that pathogen will be sent to uh, TGen North up in Flagstaff. They'll uh, run a whole genome sequencing on it and then upload that uh, data packet into a genome tracker. Uh, a fifth project I'll touch on real quick um, is, uh, is a method development um, and a project. Uh, method development is near and dear to our heart here at ADHS Chemistry because uh, we are instrument chemists. And it gives you an opportunity to uh, really learn the instrument. Uh, and in doing so, you learn the limitations and you learn what it can do. Uh, so uh, we are uh, one of nine laboratories that's, that are all uh, going to be uh, working on the MagPix system for an allergen method 
um, that can uh, be utilized um, for uh, food safety. Uh, the uh, SIX project is a uh, validation uh, for an FDA metals and bottled water uh, analytical method. Um, and uh, this is uh, long overdue, uh, uh, some would say. Um, here uh, at ADHS, we typically run bottled water using EPA method 200.8, uh, which is the, uh, which we are the drinking water method uh, for, um, uh, for water systems. Uh, and I think that uh, a lot of people would prefer um, a, a standard analytical method for bottled water. Uh, and then that's basically what the FDA has provided. So we'll be one of 11 labs that uh, are involved in a very lengthy uh, level two FDA validation. Um, and then this will be able to be pushed out. Um, and this really takes me to uh, where the meat and potatoes of our talk here, um, and that's grant number seven, and that's chemistry food safety. So uh, on this end, uh, the reason I say it's the meat and potatoes is because you're sanitarians, we're a laboratory that's involved in food safety, and I'm hoping we can work together. Uh, just you know, here at ADHS, uh, in ADHS chemistry, we have never done food safety work. We've always done uh, food defense work, or we always have identified uh, poisons and toxins in um, onesie, twosie type samples that come in the door because suspect poisonings or whatnot. But we've never done regulatory food safety work. So this is a new area for us. Uh, and um, the way it's going to work underneath the grant is that uh, we're one of 26 laboratories that essentially is a surveillance arm of the FDA. Uh, and if you remember at the beginning of the talk, I had mentioned the, uh, the, the intelligence aspect of this grant, the proactivity of this grant. Um, so the, uh, the way that works is that um, the FDA will determine what food matrices are, um, uh, should be looked at in terms of threat or food safety or have high probability. Um, how they come about that termination, um, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't have that type of security clearance, but uh, uh, they certainly do and, uh, and they certainly are. Um, so if the FDA tells us to look at uh, potato chips and canned coffee, um, then we will look at potato chips and canned coffee. And if you, um, in your jurisdiction, have a manufacturing facility that makes potato chips or canned coffee, uh, and I may be reaching out and saying, hi, um, uh, let's see if we can work together. And that's a little bit later on here in the, in the uh, program, but that's, that's basically why the food safety aspect um, uh, is the gist of this conversation that we're having today. And while I was so excited to be talking to y'all uh, during this uh, uh, council meeting. So what we're doing is uh, we're, we're gonna be analyzing um, samples, surveillance samples, uh, most of which will purchase retail um, throughout the state. And then some of which will be collected uh, by uh, registered sanitarians at, uh, during routine inspections of manufacturing facilities. Um, and those that the FDA has an interest in, those types of matrix that the FDA has an interest in that we analyze are, um, are called um, hazardous commodity pairs. And uh, so we'll certainly incorporate uh, their uh, advice on that end. Um, and then of course, all the analytical work uh, will be done under um, ISO 17025. Um, and the photos there are just simply some of the instrumentation that we use, um, yeah, GCMS, well, XRF, um, GCMS, ICPMS, LCMS, microwave digester, and uh, 96 well plate extractor. So those are some of the uh, instrumentation that we use to, uh, that we'll be using uh, for this track. Um, now, just to reiterate, uh, food safety with the LFFM grant is simply, um, there's a sample, there's a sample source, and there's a sample type. There's, so there's a sample method. Um, in year one, we're gonna be focused on metals. As I mentioned, uh, we are um, new to food safety. Uh, so in terms of our capability, 
Uh, we're starting with one of our areas of strength, which is metals analysis. Um, if we bring on the allergen method in time, we'll also be running uh, allergens, uh, food for allergens. Um, and again, this is regulatory level chemistry way different than gross contamination chemistry. So, um, so it should be really uh, a new challenge for us and we're looking forward to it. Uh, and again, the sample source uh, from a retail site or manufacturer and the sample type um, is either direction from the, um, uh, from the FDA or uh, some of jurisdictional interest. So if we wanted to look at like cactus candy or um, you know, those little suckers with a, uh, a scorpion inside or something like that, well, not, we're not gonna do that. But, but, I'm just, uh, but jurisdictional interest is something that could be of interest to you uh, as a county sanitarian saying, hey, I, I think we need to look at X and Y and Z. And uh, so please, the communication, um, uh, the, the more we work together, the better we are together. So um, in terms of surveillance, now one of the interesting aspects of the LFFM grant is the way it ties on uh, the work that we've done for food defense. And, um, and in food defense, um, we create our own samples by going out and purchasing samples. Um, and so uh, we will run product studies, matrix studies. So we might look at mustard, we'll look at leafy greens, um, we'll look at ready to eat pizza, um, so on and so on. And in 2019, uh, we looked at bottled water. So we uh, randomly um, purchased 100 samples of um, bottled water, different manufacturer, different type, different price points uh, from multiple um, retail outlets here in Maricopa County. And, uh, and we ran um, that water uh, using uh, a burn methodology uh, and uh, what we found, we weren't expecting to find anything at all, because this is bottled water. But what we found, we found two samples um, were flagged. Uh, they had to be uh, removed um, in terms of the data packets and analyzed closely. Um, and two out of 100 is 2%, um, that's one out of 50. So here we are engaged in a surveillance activity, not expecting to find anything at all, uh, and then 2% of the samples come up problematic. Um, so this is an example of how surveillance of, uh, of routine products that are being sold uh, can be um, uh, helpful. So now, uh, and in fact, this particular example is really interesting because if you look on to the left, uh, it is the, a product that, um, is a bottled water product that comes, a natural springs product that comes from a uh, company that's local to Arizona. Uh, the uh, source water is um, within one Arizona county. The uh, uh, bottling process is in another Arizona county. Um, and it, it, we determined that the arsenic level in that product that we purchased off a shelf was 10.1 uh, parts per billion. Now, the Environmental Protection Agency's maximum contaminant level for arsenic in a drinking water system is 10 parts per billion. So if this sample were to cross state lines, it would not meet the federal requirements for health because the arsenic level exceeds that of 10 parts per billion. Um, so what we did is, uh, you know, we the lab we work with our um, F, our, um, our sanitarians here at at the health department. Uh, we notified um, uh, the parties involved, uh, and the long and the short of it is, is that the uh, the company that uh, uh, owns the 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 uh, process owns the well owns the um, uh, bottling process, um, is following uh, all the uh, uh, rules and um, they are doing everything correct as per Arizona law. And uh, they are, which that includes uh, yearly testing of, um, of the source water. And they shared those results with us uh, just to demonstrate that they knew that that water was less than 10 parts per billion. And it was less than 10 parts per billion historically, not by much, but it was less than 10 parts per billion. 
And so this kind of gives a, 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 uh, an interesting uh, real world example of how um, hydrology in the earth can change over time. Uh, and you know, my advice to the parties involved was uh, more laboratory testing would be helpful because if you're uh, looking at a um, if you're looking at a uh, um, a contaminant um, and you're just under the regulatory limit, you you know some testing might put you over that regulatory limit. So um, so anyway, it was a, a good education for everybody involved. Um, and uh, since the company did not sell their product outside of the state of Arizona, it was not interstate commerce. And so therefore, um, we just notified the parties involved what was going on. And, um, and then that was that. Um, now the, the product on the right uh, was an imported product uh, from Mexico. Um, and uh, we were very surprised to see that it had measurable cadmium. Uh, and, um, and if you're not familiar with cadmium, it's one of the more poisonous of the non-radioactive uh, metals. Um, the EPA MCL for cadmium is five parts per billion. Uh, the water uh, in this particular product uh, came in at 6.1 parts per billion. Uh, since uh, it, the product itself was imported into the United States, uh, it became a federal jurisdiction. And so uh, we referred this particular sample with the data packet and the whole bit to the uh, FDA um, for enforce enforcement purposes. So this is a really neat example of how just a routine surveillance can find problems uh, in, the, um, in the food supply. Um, and so it um, highlights how we can uh, work with the LFFM grant in terms of food safety um, and, uh, and routine surveillance. So um, now I'm gonna uh, talk a little bit about FISMA. Um, I know you all have heard a lot about FISMA and you're probably tired of hearing about it. Uh, but it's it's the uh, supply uh, safety system, and the way it's going to affect us here at the AHS laboratory is the Manufactured Food Regulatory Program standards or MFRPS. Um, as you're aware, uh, the MFRPS does provide a regulatory foundation that ensures the protection of manufactured food. Uh, that's created within the United States by mandating that all 50 states and the territories meet at minimum a federal floor that defines food safety compliance. Um, so, uh, and right now, um, Arizona has still not, or is in the process, I should say, of going into rule uh, with regards to MFRPS um, law uh, that was an activity that was supposed to take place in spring of 2020. Imagine that it didn't with the pandemic. Oh my gosh. So, um, so it among, you know, everyone else's workload got pushed off until, um, until things are somewhat back to normal. Uh, but we at ADHS are looking at um, a, a MFRPS. There is a work group um, uh, for uh, the MFRPS rules. Uh, if you are interested in um, assisting uh, with the rule creation, uh, and I, I would highly recommend that that you reach out to the folks that are hosting this meeting and um, and and volunteer for the work group, um, because ultimately um, the NFRPS will oversee uh, all the interstate sales of manufactured food made within the state of Arizona. And that food is manufactured within your jurisdiction, then you as a sanitarian have a, a responsibility to ensure that that food is safe. And so, um, and the rules have to be written in such a way that uh, allow you to do your job um, and, uh, and also protects the, uh, the, the vendor um, and, uh, and then the public's health. So if you look at, I'm just gonna show this real quick, um, the extent of MFRPS. Uh, you know, we're an Amazon generation. Uh, we order uh, uh, something today and it's delivered tomorrow. Uh, so you can order 
maple syrup from Vermont and it'll get here ship the next day. Uh, this demonstrates just how much truck traffic there is moving food across the United States. So, um, and it granted all long haul truck traffic isn't, isn't food, but a great deal of it is. Now, if you look at, um, if I have a marker, I'd, I'd point out Arizona and Los Angeles, but there's a pretty thick blue line in between Phoenix and LA, and then also Interstate 8 down there to San Diego. Um, and uh, if you look at the economics of the cost of doing business in California versus the cost of doing business in Arizona, and if you look at the price of fuel and, um, and transportation costs, um, there's an, an argument could be made that it's less expensive to go into business here in Arizona and sell food to the 23 million people that live in Southern California, as well as the 7 million people that live in Arizona. Uh, and so if your county does not have uh, manufactured food uh, facilities, um, my guess is they probably will at some point. Um, so MFRPS is a really important um, aspect of the FISMA um, that protects the, um, the food supply from the manufacturer side, and it is a critical component of the LFFM grant um, because uh, the FDA uh, is requesting that all, uh, um, well, not all, there's no way you can test all manufacturing food, but that, that uh, food be tested at the retail um, outlets, and then in addition, food be tested uh, at the manufacturing facilities before it reaches the retail outlet. So on that note, uh, it, you may not be surprised that ADHS uh, here, the laboratory, uh, we are the designated MFRPS laboratory for the state of Arizona. Uh, and then that, and not even before, uh, we work directly, of course, with the 15 counties and the 22 tribes. Um, uh, we don't charge for our services. Um, and, and if you have uh, sanitarian related um, analytical work, um, and many of you have, and most of it's microbiological, but, um, but then you're familiar with uh, submitting samples to us. Um, and if not, then please uh, contact me and I'll be more than happy to help you walk, walk through the process. Um, really what it comes down to is um, here at ADHS uh, Chemistry, we need samples for MFRPS analysis. Um, so we need your help. Um, we need your help to collect the food products um, because if I have no authority to go into a manufacturing facility and as a government um, worker, I would have no expectation that a private business would give me samples. So there simply has to be a law and rule in place that allow the collection of samples. And in that, we're going to rule. Um, as I mentioned, um, the MFRPS rules uh, will be um, uh, worked on in 2021. There is a committee that has been uh, uh, pulled together uh, for um, experts in the field to give advice. Um, uh, I will be on that committee uh, as a representation of what we need for the MFRPS grant. Um, if you all have um, uh, experience or the interest in uh, defining uh, how this would work in your jurisdiction, then I um, highly recommend that you talk to um, the, uh, the folks here, um, the sanitarians here at ADHS, and, um, and just simply um, see what it entails. Um, and I'm going to leave with a little bit of, uh, I guess, patriotism, but also a fact. We want to work with you. We need to work with you. We want to um, uh, collect samples uh, from manufacturing facilities. Uh, we need to, to analyze those samples uh, for food safety, and we can't do it without your help. And so what I hope we can work together uh, as the future comes about, um, I may be uh, reaching out to, to y'all, and, and, um, and please feel free to reach out to me. Um, that's my contact information.